Hello and welcome to AA Beyond Belief, the podcast. I'm your host, John S. Today I'll be speaking with Joe C., author of Beyond Belief, Agnostic Musings for 12-Step Life, a co-founder of Canada's first agnostic AA group, host of Rebellion Dogs Radio, and the person who most inspired me to get involved in general service. Here's Joe talking service. Hello, Joe. How you doing? Hey, uh, good to hear you, John. I haven't uh, really talked to you since uh, Austin, and uh, I'm still uh, smiling from uh, our Austin conference. Yeah, I have to say I am too. I had a good time there and uh, seeing everybody and meeting people that I had never met before. Good experience. Looking forward to Toronto in... Actually, I'm going to go to the Toronto, um, your your uh, regional one in 2017. Then then I'll be up there in 2018 yeah. also. Yeah. Okay. Well, you are um, one of the founders of the very first agnostic AA group in uh, Canada. And I thought it might be interesting to kind of go into that history, Joe, if you'd like to talk about that a little bit. You know, what? how did that come about and what has been your experience with that? Sure. I'll, I'll talk to you about that. I'll, I'll t- uh, let me uh, start with a story. I was uh, visiting a friend, an AA friend. Uh, we were, Lisa and I were uh, up north. I imagine living in Toronto and going for- further north, but that's what we do for fun. And um, we went to a meeting and they were reading about the 12th tradition, something I haven't done for a long time. Sat in a meeting where we read from the 12 and 12. And it's going on about God Almighty this and how God works in our life here and how every boy dreams to be our country's president. And <laughs> just, yeah, you know, they, what, that line was in there. Yeah. It was, but if other people find that frustrating, because these same people in meetings say things that make me roll my eyes when I'm working with them on public information or making uh, groups more accessible to people with disabilities or putting on a conference. We've got our sleeves rolled up. It's a more concrete, action-oriented discussing. Uh, it's not that abstract explanation of a phenomena of addiction and the phenomena of recovery, which honestly none of us can, you know, really explain well. Okay, so um, yeah, so the you know service work is very secular. If you read the traditions, they only mention God once, and it's really just talking about group conscience and, you know, uh, this idea that when the group makes an informed group conscience, that that's God working in his mysterious ways. And I, I don't believe that's so, but it, it doesn't really matter. It, it just it talks about tradition to uh, about the group. Uh, how they come about their decision-making process. Mm -hmm. And there's no leaders, we're trusted servants, yada, yada, yada. You get to the concepts of world service, and it doesn't mention God at all. Uh, I was at a committee meeting uh, on accessibility, and we're talking about how to properly identify groups. I mean, what we're talking about is some groups are semi-accessible, like they've got a ramp where there's stairs and they've got a power door at the front, but maybe the washrooms, you couldn't fit one of those motorized scooters in there, or uh, maybe the actual room that the group meets in uh, doesn't have an automatic door, so it's not as accessible as it could be. So, you know, we spent a whole hour, Nobody talked about turning this problem over to God or stand them, right? right. <laughs> so you avoid all of that, right? And and the other great thing about getting involved in service is people don't fear what they know. People fear what they don't know. And, mm-hmm. and if there are uh, some groups or members that have, uh, you know, a sort of knee-jerk hostility towards the idea of secular AA, you know, that a lot of that, uh, not all of it, but a lot of it can be overcome by working side by side uh, with carrying the message to uh, newcomers, working at a treatment center, putting on a meeting together, uh, working in a workshop together or a committee for two years. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to just get to know each other as people, not as conflicting ideology. 
Yeah, I agree with that. You know, um, when when we started our group in Kansas City, and it was really partly because of listening to your podcast and some of the things that you wrote, I decided that I was going to get involved with our district um, here in Kansas City and even the area assembly and all of that. And I had no idea what I was getting into, but I was expecting that when I got there that I'd be greeted with some hostility because I was um, an agnostic group and everything. And it was just completely the opposite. They welcomed me. They actually applauded. And at the very first meeting, one of the people there apologized for saying the Lord's Prayer at the end of the meeting. They were just really, really great to me. And then um, over time, I started pitching in with them and helping them with just projects. And it didn't matter, you know, what I believed or didn't believe, or it, it didn't, none of that mattered. It was just what what the work that got needed to get done. I helped them with, and we just kind of became friends. And now I um, I love my district and my my area assembly. I just I feel like almost a, that's almost as much of my home group as my regular home group is. It's kind of something I wasn't expecting. So now I don't even have a voting position at our area assembly, but I'm still going to go there and participate. I'm going to help with the archive committee by recording stories. So, yeah. Oh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that, you know, like I, I really think AA history isn't something which happened way back when. You've heard me say that before. Mm -hmm. It's going on right now. Uh, you know, we're approaching our second century, and so things are going to be very different in the second century of Alcoholics Anonymous than they are now. Mm -hmm. And it's what we do now that's going to influence, you know, how newcomers are greeted at the door in 2035 and mm -hmm. 2050. And, you know, not all of us will be here when that happens, but we still have an impact on it, or we can if we want to. Yeah. And I, I'll, I, you know, like I say, my sobriety is a phenomena, and it's a phenomena because I I know what sobriety is. I can identify my sobriety. I can even see sobriety in others. But I, I can't tell you why I'm sober. Yes, I did the steps. Lots of people don't, and they stay sober. So that isn't it. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I went to meetings, but plenty of people go from the meeting. Like they do 90 and 90 days and then go to the liquor store. Right. Right. So so that can't be it in a nutshell. Um, you know, I don't believe in God, uh, but some people who do relapse, that can't be it. Mm -hmm. Right. What what is it that keeps me sober? I'm not sure. But but they keep talking about this plan of action. So I I, I do my praying on my feet. You know, mm -hmm. I'm going to do stuff. I'm going to get active. And thinking about AA's future, you don't get as bogged down in our dogma as you do looking at what was recorded in the 1930s, 40s, or 50s. Mm -hmm. But you talk about being a stu that we have a responsibility to be stewards of AA, and the way that I, I see that is AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, is going to change like everything in the universe changes, mm -hmm. and then we have a responsibility to help guide it through that change. But sometimes I wonder if if maybe we might be able to push it a little bit, and if we should. Um, like, you know, it seems like AA is kind of resistant to um, changing its basic um, recovery literature, or just revising it, or updating it, or making it more secular, and it seems like we should be able to do that. And do you think it's okay to try to do that, or to for us to even try to organize our groups in an effort to do that, or, or is that not right? I, I think it's absolutely right, especially at the group level. There is no approved literature list. Mm -hmm. So our groups can read whatever we want, uh, choose whatever rituals we want. And the more groups that do more progressive things, the more progressive AA is. It's not like we should petition general service to tell us what to do yeah. and make sure the other group does it too. Who cares what the other group does? Right. We need to control our own destiny. And, you know, our group, for instance, uh, the personality has changed greatly over the last few years. We started in 2009, and most of us, three quarters of us, were sober over 10 years. And now half of our group is sober less than a year. Oh, wow. So uh, it's obviously working yeah. because there are people who came to, they've never known a Toronto AA without agnostic AA. You know, like, what are you complaining about, Joe? <laughs> I go, oh, yeah, you're right, right? I got lots of meetings to choose from where I don't have to 
you know, fight with anybody about ideology. Yeah. And and some of them go to other meetings and some of them don't. But the point is, at our group, we're doing something that the the writing is on the wall. It's working. Could we reach more people by changing this or changing that? Why not try it? The way we uh, we rent our room from the University of Toronto. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have to apply every semester. It's a four month increments. And they put us where they can because all of the academic requests get handled first and all of the outside groups get filled in whatever slots are available. And our Thursday meeting, which has always been 6.30 to 7.30, they had nothing Thursday at 6.30. So Mm -hmm. It's going to be moved to 8.30. Is that going to attract more people? Are people, other people going to not come? We don't know. We'll find out, right? right? But you can always change things, right? Like mm-hmm. we do uh, get, you, you talked about AA as a whole and their resistance to change. It's, it's not that. It's that there's a cognitive dissonance that, that like they, they try, uh, but they also resist. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to just uh, read something from the uh, 66th annual meeting of the General Service Conference of Alcoholics Anonymous. So this was April 2016, uh, where all of our delegates in Canada and the U.S. and trustees and all of the members of the General Service Conference met. And there were advisory actions. So these are the things that we decided on. And One of the advisory actions was at the 2017 conference, which will be this April coming up. Right. The theme is going to be supporting our future. That's progressive. Yeah. That's a great idea. But there was another uh, advisory action brought up and it was uh, rejected. And that advisory action was, uh, let me just find it exactly. Yeah. PI wanted a... um, a better social media uh, presence. They wanted a not-for-profit a YouTube page right. and a Twitter account and right. a Google non-for-profit page. And at, at least on some of that, they were told no. And on others of it, you know, well, come back with a proposal next year. So uh, on one t- hand, they're saying, let's think about the future. and And it just doesn't seem to make sense to think of the future and not think of the internet as being the roadway, the highway to the future. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. You know, I was reading the um, general, the report from the General Service Conference, the last one, and I actually was reading um, Amy, the executive editor's um, talk, and she was talking to the conference, and she says, imagine if we had a YouTube page. Imagine if we had, if the Grapevine had its own podcast. Imagine if we had um, a forum where um, our readers could interact on our website. Imagine if, and all this kind of stuff. But she never really proposed or asked or anything like that. But she was just asking the conference to use their imagination and ask, you know, what... You know, is is this stuff possible, or you know, what 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 would happen if we did this? But it doesn't. I don't know why they're so. Why we are, I guess, we AA are so afraid of the internet. I think you once pointed out we're all over the internet anyway. We're already on YouTube. We're already on Facebook. So exactly, and and I have you know some of the old AA dogma that I've grown up with, like. Like the anonymity thing is strictly at the level of press, radio and films. Right. And uh, at the Austin conference, um, I participated in a panel with a a blogger Mm -hmm. and another podcaster Mm -hmm. uh, on living cyber Mm -hmm. sort of online recovery. And and they um, Chris, Mm -hmm. who runs since right now. Uh, was simulcasting it uh, yeah. to the website. Yep, yep. And, you know, it's an open meeting. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it's a violation of uh, anonymity. Well, I said anyone who wants to participate, who doesn't want their uh-huh. their mug shot appearing, uh, just say so, and we'll point the camera somewhere else, right? right? But anyone can walk into an open meeting and see me at the podium. That's right. I'm not going to tell you my last name or where I live or what I do for business or if right. you look or quote on this, give me a call, you know, operators are waiting, you know, so I'm, I'm not trying to use my, you know, uh, sort of cachet or my 
currency of A8 for personal gain. Right. You know, but, you know, open meetings are, you know, you, you see the people. Right. <laughs> That's right. So let's try this. And, and that was, you know, outside of my comfort zone. But in one day, over 2,400 people saw that. They, yeah. At an AA meeting. And that's four, four times as many or six times as many people that went to the whole conference. Yep. And how is that so different? Like if, like, like you say, it's an open meeting. What if we were just in a big auditorium somewhere and the, whole, and the public, the city was invited? It would be the same thing, wouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely right. Uh, or you put on a, a public information meeting for uh, medical students. Yeah. Or, or, uh, you know, well, that'd be CPC maybe, or you put on, you know, uh, if, yeah, any sort of community based thing where you're there, right? Yep. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's the principle of anonymity, mm-hmm. not the actual, well, what, what are the rules? What do you have to do and what must you not do, right? So right. everyone has to define that for themselves. And I'm pretty strict on that, actually. A, mm-hmm. a, authors use their their last name Mm -hmm. a lot of AA authors were well-known authors before they were sober so what are they going to do all of a sudden disappear from their audience Uh, right doesn't make sense for them even though it it does make sense for me uh to just be joe c and uh some of the magazines i write for want a mugshot and Mm -hmm. maybe i'd be on page two or three if that Mm -hmm. i did that and i i don't provide that and Maybe that means I'm in the back of the magazine, but <laughs> there, I'm not, you know, it's not a popularity contest. Uh, you know, I, I just, you know, I'm, it's a privilege to write for them and right. they respect my boundaries and I respect theirs. And it, it, you know, for now it works out. So, so none of these things are cast in stone. So no. we put our AA meeting on YouTube right now, if we want, you know, we don't need to ask general services permission right. if we want their opinion, we'll give it to them. You know, there's also a change in attitude generationally. This is something that I've noticed. Um, Like our group has its own public Facebook page. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while, we'll get a a person who's never been to AA before will send us a message and ask us about coming to a meeting. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes they do so even publicly. Mm -hmm. And what I'm finding is... um, they have absolutely no stigma attached to the idea of getting help. And in fact, they often want to bring a friend with them for support to the meeting. Yeah. And so that's what happens. So I guess these people are like in their 20s or so, uh, this type of this generation. And that's what will happen. Mm-hmm. They'll post on Facebook that they're going to a meeting and they let all their friends know. And then some of them will join them for support. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> and it's totally normal. And, and that isn't, and, you know, one of the questions we talked about at uh, our panel was, you know, is, you know, uh, your smiling face and your one year medallion or your three month chip mm-hmm. on your Facebook, is that a violation of anonymity? Well, that depends whether you call, you know, Bob's Facebook page a public media who, yeah. who goes there? You know, is CNN combing through people's Facebook for news? And, and would that be news to them? Right. Uh, or is it just his friends? Is he just like like having dinner to celebrate his one year sober and inviting his friends in and outside of recovery, right? Mm-hmm. Lots of people do that, right? Let's right. go to dinner. Let's celebrate. And and you're in a, you, you haven't booked the whole restaurant. There's people at other tables that aren't in AA. They're going to overhear your conversation. Yeah. I mean, we talk recovery in the subway and, you know, in public spaces. I right. mean, it, it really, when you get, you know, to treating the traditions as strict rules, it gets silly because right. all these things are, uh, are more abstract and more complicated than that. And the whole idea behind anonymity really, I think, was for it was for public relations. You didn't want to have a person say that they were speaking for AA, that they were the AA spokesperson. I That's think- exactly right. And and they were right to do that. Mm-hmm. And they were also right not to make it a rule. They had mm-hmm. famous baseball players who, you know, were on the front of the Cleveland mm-hmm. tradition, whatever it was, you know, AA member. And the problem with that is these people could 
you know, get drunk and then everyone's mocking AA. Oh, yeah, look at this. Look at look at what happened to so and so. Uh, that's the risk. That was one of the risks and why we encouraged anonymity. Let's, uh, you know, make it about the fellowship, not the individuals. B- but it's not a rule. Plenty of people have found AA because a rock star they knew or a journalist they knew uh, wrote about or talked about being in AA or going to some 12-step meeting and getting sober. And they thought, well, if they can do it, maybe it's not the culty, uncool place that I thought it was, and I'll try it too. So it, it, every time these traditions are broken, so to speak, and I say that with, uh, mm-hmm. you know, good things happen and bad things happen. So yeah. what do you gain and what do you lose from each of these uh, indiscretions? Yeah. And how do you know if it's if you still need the, the tradition if you don't break it once in a while anyway? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now, that, I mean, that's the thing about it. You can't unring a bell, uh-huh. right? Right. Once you put it out there, you know, you can't take it back. Yeah. So, you know, using prudence and, you know, common sense and asking around is a really good idea. But, yeah, yeah it's just... Uh, it, just not hard and fast rules. That's what people people seem to crave authority more than ever, right? Yeah. We have a ship that you know gives the ultimate authority to the member, uh, unlimited uh, you know autonomy to the groups. We only ask that you consider other groups or AA as a whole. Uh, but no, no, we want GSO to rule on whether this group has it right or that group has it right. Right, <laughs> and they're not going to. Yeah. Well, I know in Western Missouri, they're very, very conservative about the whole internet thing. There was a vote, not a vote, I guess. Yeah, there was a request for the um, assembly about the idea of putting the um, state um, convention on Facebook so that people could um, sign up for it. And yeah. and the reason they decided not to do it is because. Um, they say it's one thing for you to break your own anonymity, but if if you like, if I were to sign up for the state AA convention and then um, I somehow a friend of mine is somehow <laughs> I, I'm outing a friend of mine or something is, is what it's is what they were concerned about. So they decided not to do it. It didn't make sense to me. I thought, wait a second, it's just a just a Facebook page, and you know, it's, it's up to somebody to decide if they want to say they're going to go to the convention or not. I, I don't know. Maybe next time it's something like that comes up, I'll try to speak out for it. But they're very conservative about that here. Yeah, well, and and that's not a wrong decision. But is AA growing in that area? Are younger people coming in? Right. And, you know, if they can't answer yes to those questions, then maybe it's worth the risk of trying something new. So that's that's what I enjoy about this because you know um, actually I have to say that at our area assembly they will list they listen to everybody and you know if if you're the lone voice for something um, you get to speak again you know after the vote yeah. and, and to see if other people change their mind so it's very orderly it's very respectful um, everybody is really trying to do what they think is best for the area and for AA as a whole. And I don't know. I I I I I've just um, have fallen in love with that whole process. I don't always get my way, but I always come away feeling like I've been heard. Yeah. In other words, you don't always get your way, but you always get your say. Yeah. And that's the ultimate uh, democracy at work. Yeah. Uh, you know, like I, uh, you know, I I get it from both sides. Am I critical of AA? Sure. You know, do I want certain things to change? Yeah. Um, But when other people rag on AA is this way or AA is that way, you know, I say, hey, you know, look at me, buddy, right here. I'm AA. Tell me I insist on someone believing in God. Tell me that I'm against harm reduction. Tell me Mm -hmm. that, you know, I'm going to tell my... Uh, sponsy exactly what to do. I mean, those things aren't true of me, so you can't say those things are true of AA because I'm AA. Right. That's the genius of um, AA as far as I'm concerned because it all boils down to the personal freedom of every AA member is, is as free as they can possibly be 
to practice the AA program in any way that they want to. And then every group is totally on its own to do its own thing without anybody else telling them what to do. Mm-hmm. And and that's that's really what kind of makes this whole thing work. But it's hard for people to understand that, especially if you're outside of AA, but even sometimes people inside of AA, people, I'm always assume that there's some top-down structure that says, okay, these are the rules, that this is the program, this is what we all must do. And it's not that way. And sometimes even people in, in the fellowship, I think, don't quite get that, that you can make this whatever you want to make it. People do have these preconceived ideas, and that's why I think public information is important. Uh, some people are against public information at all. We're attraction rather than promotion. Let people find us. If they want it enough, they're going to find us. But people have preconceived ideas, and that is a barrier to recovery. And if we can eliminate some of those preconceived ideas, we're eliminating a barrier to recovery. And, uh, you know, isn't that what our primary purpose is? That's interesting. You said that it was actually the private, it was the um, public information committee that was wanting to do the Twitter account. Yeah. Right. That just makes sense in this day and age, actually, doesn't it? To have yeah. that. It, it does, and, and other people are concerned with it. And the people who are concerned with it are the people who probably don't use the medium. Mm-hmm. And so, in essence, what you have is people who aren't social media, um, uh, you know, right. sa- uh, making a decision about what, how social media savvy people should uh, find out about AA. It doesn't make any sense to me. It, it's not like now we're eliminating meetings and we're eliminating our intergroup they'll have to go to twitter that no, no one's saying that right you know they're, right. They're saying let's add this other layer where uh people go for information and we'll provide information to them it's not promotion you know i've i've said before in 19 uh, i guess the first time i was working the phones at intergroup would have been 1977 wow there was no internet but AA ran an ad in the personal columns of the newspaper. Yep. This paper is, it's made of paper. People write stuff. Anyway, uh, yep. <laughs> you ask your, ask your grandparents. Yeah. <laughs> but so, so they ran this newspaper ad that said, if you want to drink and can, that's your business. Uh-huh. If you want to quit, but you can't, that's our business. All AA. And yeah. it had the phone number. So, you know, that, I mean, the equivalent of that today would be to have a Twitter page. Right. Where AA put out this month's grapevine, blah, blah, blah. Right. Or um, AA survey shows there are now this number meetings in America and this number meetings worldwide. No, you're right. You know, I actually had that experience. I was 19 when I was first considering calling AA, and it was from a newspaper advertisement in Lawrence, Kansas that I saw. And I kept reading it and thinking about calling, and I just told myself, oh, no, this is, this is, this is silly to think like this. <laughs> I, I didn't do it. But, you know, had the internet been then, I would have probably gone online and tried to find something, which I know people do now. But uh, nowadays, if you get online, you can find so much conflicting information or there's a lot more a lot more uh, i guess more options for people now than than um what i had back then anyway and what you had yeah Which is good it, it, absolutely great uh i'm uh i'm opening my eyes to things like uh treatment i i never went to a treatment center but many of the people i work with in recovery whether it's going through the 12 steps or some other capacity that, I mean, they're either counselors, there's a lot of counselors mm-hmm. in recovery that are still into, you know, sort of growth and expanding their self-awareness. And there are, or they've been to treatment centers, right? So I've got, you know, these this accumulation of preconceived ideas I have about the p- treatment process that isn't based on any personal experience. So I'm volunteering now and... Uh, you know, I, I'm keeping my mouth shut largely. I'm just hearing people going through their process and lots of people, they go to aftercare, but they don't go to AA or, uh, they go to AA and they go to aftercare or, you know, they, you know, they're doing cognitive behavioral therapy and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, it just, we never wanted to be 
the one-stop shop for everybody. And that's uh, something that I have learned actually fairly recently and have opened my mind to by talking to John Stewart, because mm-hmm. he's like, well, he has a site that's called Leaving AA, but he's definitely not anti-AA. He's more mm-hmm. pro-choice is what he says. Yeah. He, he says, why do you have to just do only one thing? Why does mm-hmm. it have to be AA? Why can't you do AA and smart? Or why can't you do AA and life ring or AA and whatever, you know? Um, he even takes it as far as the Sinclair method. I'm like, well, maybe you can do that too. I don't know. <laughs> you know, so, you know, so, um, yeah, um, I've, I've kind of opened to that. I think that people should do that. You should do whatever you, you need to do to help, help yourself because, uh, I've seen too many people die from this thing. So you got to do what you got to do. I read a really interesting article. There's a guy named Terry Gorski who has been blogging as long as there's been blogging about recovery, you know, sort of professionally and the uh, peer-to-peer community type articles. And he was talking, uh, you know, just to talk about carrying the message in institutions about, you know, there are all these agnostic steps uh, maybe though that's what we should AA should be bringing into institutions, uh, and that's like he's not a member of our sort of community. I, who knows what he believes, but mm-hmm. but he's just saying that people are getting sued. They're saying, why don't you have smart instead of this? Because there is no smart. You know, there's smart in our uh, uh, Phoenix uh, treatment center, but there's no smart in our uh, Buffalo, New York you know, treatment center, we need, you know, so why not use the secular AA, you're covered on the First Amendment issues, right, you know, separate, you know, church and state. And, you know, he he did succinctly point out how, uh, whether you believe AA is religious, or you do not, uh, legally, uh, the 12 steps have been deemed to be religious content, right, uh, by circuit courts. Uh, the big book has been deemed to be a religious, you know, and I, I, I don't agree with that, you don't. but it's what the law is that that's what the, the law can change, right? Yeah. Some can challenge those things, but right now that is the reality. Right. So if you offer only this option, you run the risk of, uh, you know, sort of violating someone's first amendment rights. And he's just saying that, AA already has a way to overcome that, right? A, we didn't ask to be in those institutions. We didn't ask uh, treatment centers to do 12-step right. facilitation where they're encouraging, you know, their medical patients to right. go to a sponsor. And we didn't ask them to do that. Yeah. And uh, But if they're going to do that, why don't they use this, you know, uh, sort of neutral a way of doing things. Usually if we go into a treatment center, it's an individual group that decides, you know, that that takes on the responsibility or maybe a district. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing that prevents an AA group from going in there and saying, hey, this is how, this is one way that you can interpret the steps and and here here they are, read them. Uh, Mm -hmm. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. That would be just like reading outside literature or something, I would think. Sure. And we go into treatment centers and we in Toronto, we read outside literature. There's a very popular uh, poem called Just for Today Mm -hmm. that isn't AA. Mm -hmm. It's been written by an AA member. I have no idea, but it certainly wasn't conference approved. Uh, But it appears on the Toronto uh, Beginners pamphlet, which includes the John Hopkins 20 questions, which is an AA, Mm -hmm. Yesterday, Today and Tomorrow, which is an AA the steps which are and the traditions that are. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Toronto Intergroup uses non-conference approved literature. Right. So, you know, and, and in the treatment centers, this is one of the readings, right? So, so we're already doing that, right? So Mm -hmm. to say, well, we, this, we, we can argue that we're in support of this, but we're not in support of that. Well, if you got a good reason to not do it, state it but if 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 you're if you have some sort of slippery slope or opening the floodgates argument just try it and see what happens right our agnostic group puts on meetings and detoxes Mm -hmm. and you know like uh we we were having this discussion someone with who you know hey come to the detox okay and oh i don't want to read the steps 
you know, I, I don't believe in that. Mm -hmm. I, I, okay. Anyone here want to read the steps? And there's always someone who's been there. <laughs> they put up their hand here. Yeah. You know, like it doesn't offend me to listen to them. It, it doesn't represent me in any way, shape or form. Uh, so that is our AA steps. But, you know, there is a, also in the format, if I'm chairing that meeting, that I'm to tell them wh where I come from, my home group, right. my story. And, of course, I'm going to tell that in my own words. So people uh, can figure it out. Uh, it might be a good idea, and this is something we've all talked about before, if uh, as a collective, as a, the collective of secular AA groups and members uh, doing some sort of communication you know, in the same way AA does, not separate from, mm -hmm. as part of, like the International Lawyers Association for AA. Right. They 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 do advocacy for lawyers with addiction, right. with alcoholism, uh, and they're not separate from AA. No. Uh, d uh, the uh, International Doctors uh, AA Convention also does advocacy mm -hmm. for doctors. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we're doing advocacy for atheists and agnostics, you know, we're not not AA because right. we're uh, catering to a specific group any more than a young people's video is not AA because there's nobody the average AA age of 50 in the video. Right. <laughs> it is kind of sad when you see the, the age in a, a AA meeting. <laughs> but, but, um, well, no, it's, it, it's what, what do you know about someone with a you know, two black eyes. Well, they had to be told twice. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, um, when you talk about changing the steps, this is kind of going to be interesting, I think, because I wonder, do you think after the um, Human Rights Tribunal that there'll be a change in attitude about the idea of groups using um, different forms of the steps? Um, my concern is about um, what is now in the Toronto area and maybe in some areas is what I would call and the human rights tribunal would use this language a poisonous environment mm. where there's you know microaggression or overt hostility towards a certain underrepresented population like mm. you know so so my you know perfect solution is, we look into the future and we see nobody cares about agnostic groups any more than they care about LGBT groups or young people's groups or women's groups or men's groups. And, and to this day, some people think women don't need and shouldn't have their own meeting. Yeah. Men and women feel that way. You know, some young people, why would I want to, you know, if I want to get laid, I'll go to a young people's yeah. meeting. If I want to get, laid, I'll go here. Right. Yeah. You know, I, but where someone else, no, no, I, I'm not get. You know, I need people who speak my language and, and each generation has its own language. Right. So, and that's the, the secularists argument too. Right. You know, mm -hmm. don't explain sobriety in terms of some supernatural force that helped me out because I don't believe in that, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not, certainly not going to talk in God acronyms just to make everybody else feel comfortable. So uh, to get back to answering your question, which was about five minutes ago, um, uh, I think there will still, it will always be controversial. Mm -hmm. AA was born in riots. Yeah. There were controversy before there were agnostic groups. There will be controversy in our dying breath of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I, I just hope that we have a more, uh, less fear, because it's really the fear that this is going to confuse the newcomer. Yeah. Uh, this is going to water down AA. This is going to uh, cause a divide between, you know, secular AA versus religious AA. And I, I don't think any of that is necessarily so, although the loudest voices are these polar opposites, the majority of AA are in the middle, and they couldn't care less what somebody else does at their own meeting. They wouldn't even think about it. They're apathetic to, you know, what young people do in their meetings or, you know, whether they go bowling or go dancing or work through the big book exactly as the first hundred members did. Or, yep. You know, they don't care what they're doing at their group because they don't go to their group. You know, but yeah. they 
about what our rituals are in my group because this is what I depend on for my recovery. Right. You know, you were talking about underrepresented groups. Um, the grapevine, I think, right now, if I understand what they're trying to do, is trying to reach out to underrepresented groups, us being one of them. Yeah. But there's a lot of underrepresented groups in AA. Um, and one thing that we're dealing with in Missouri is, um, you know, there's only like, I think, um, in the AA population, there's only like 4% African American representation in AA, I believe. And in the United States, I think they make up like 15% of the population. And so that's not, that's a real problem that for some reason, we're not reaching the African American community in AA. I don't know why that is. But um, we had an issue in Missouri where there was kind of a race, there was a racist incident at one of our um, conventions where some some idiot showed up in blackface, right? So now mm-hmm. we're, we're having a... Um, going to have a conversation starting in January about what to do about being more inclusive and, 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 and I don't know, unity is what they're talking about. So they want to include the agnostics and the atheists, but also talking about other uh, minority groups. And um, the black, black population is definitely one of those. And I was talking to some people about it, and they think that one issue might be, and it's, it's really kind of complicated, but a lot of it might be because, um, you know, N.A. doesn't seem to have a, this problem with the black population like we do. They have, they're have they represented proportionally, I guess, whereas mm-hmm. A.A. isn't. And it's like A.A. has this resistance to letting people talk about um, whatever drug use that they might have um, been involved with. And maybe mm-hmm. that might be part of the problem. Yeah. And again, that's a meeting for meeting thing. I mean, nobody bats an eye or, or frowns if someone in my home group says, my name's Joe and I'm an addict and then goes on and talks about, you know, whether we're talking about step two or right. uh, sober in the holidays or, you know, family issues, uh, you know, whatever. They go on and talk about their topic. Who, who cares how they identify themselves and what they did, right? Like, right. like what is an outside issue? Politics and religion. Right. Yeah. Uh, are drugs other than alcohol an outside issue? Not as far as your story goes. Right, I don't think yeah. so either. And they always go hand in hand, it seems, with alcohol. Yeah, yeah. And and you go through like these these like epidemics that we have, you know. Um, whereas like the, we had a crack at epidemic where which was primarily affecting the black community, mm-hmm. and um, AA really we and AA we AA members weren't really. I think doing doing what we could have done fully to address that, and then and now we're having like a heroin um, epidemic, yes. Yeah. Um, and I I get calls occasionally from the WAF Central line of people that are starting um, groups um, like in uh, New England and New, up, upstate New York, really it's all over, but in that region in particular they're having a terrible heroin problem. And they're telling me that um, that these kids are dying, and they just want to have a meeting where people can feel um, welcomed and comfortable. Mm-hmm. And they want to have they want to have the, these drug addicts in their meetings. I say, well, there's no problem with that. Uh, well, so, so you're asking why uh, it, is NA doing a better job than we are? I guess uh, so. Yeah, I, I would say part of that is systemic. Uh, because we rely so much on early AA literature, which was white American middle class men, right. right? That seems to be who's attracted to AA because, like, I'm agnostic and I, you know, uh, you know, was gritting my teeth through some of the reading about Step Twelve. Anyone who was gay would have done the same thing. Talking. You know, it, it's all talking about the the male alcoholic in the household and how the wife, the yeah. Yeah. And, you know, like, you know, that like, how, how, how can we read this without being embarrassed? I know. <laughs> and N.A. literature has been written more recently. Yeah. Uh, at the Ontario Regional Conference, which is our big AA conference and Alan on and Alateen, mm-hmm. we have. It's just the way we've always done it. A picture of Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob, two white guys. And that sends a message. You walk into that room for the first (laughs) time, right? Right. Where's the first lesbian in AA? Right. Where's the first African-American? Where's, you know, like, 
if we're honoring these people, and maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't, uh, then we have to honor all of the firsts. Yeah. Right? Our, our co-founders, great. You know, our first, um, you know, member with a disability, our first this, our, you know, like all of those things have to be uh, revered in the same way. Otherwise, we're going to systemically discriminate, and that seems to be how, like, the statistics don't lie to us. No. Do our membership survey, and we have more men than women. We have more older people than young people. We have more Caucasians than we have people of color. Right. That is telling us, and and that isn't true with the people who are being shipped to our rooms from treatment centers. They're more d- diverse. They, they still have problems, too, because they cater to people who have health care, and there's some systemic discrimination there, too, right? Right. Most Anglo-Saxons have health care than people of color. And so, um, but they're still doing a better job and, and they're sending the, the bus load to us. And some of those people make friends in AA and feel comfortable and some of them don't. Mm-hmm. And our statistics can tell us what we need to do to change that. Well, and, I'm looking forward to what happens in Missouri. I think that we're taking it very, very seriously. And it was interesting to hear the discussion at the area assembly because there was a lot of really um, serious misunderstanding uh, from some of the people um, in different parts of the state about how it was affecting the the black membership because yeah. they were totally offended by what happened, totally offended. And there were people from other parts of the state that were saying, oh, this guy was just you know, having a sense of humor. You guys need to have a sense of humor. And mm-hmm. it's like they weren't, they weren't even trying to understand why people were offended by it. So I think it's going to be good when we all start sitting down together and start discussing these things. Because when you do it at that level, at that service level, mm-hmm. people are forced to listen and listen again and listen again until you finally, I think, come to some understanding and resolution. And I'm very interested in this because I I do think that there's a serious problem with um, underrepresented groups. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I feel silly sometimes for me as, as like, I might be the only open atheist there, but my problems aren't near as bad as, um, you know, the African American, because, you know, I, I can walk into the room and everybody else is in the room is white like me and nobody, you know, I don't have a big A on my forehead, let them know I'm an atheist, you know, yeah. so there's, a, there's just a lot of stuff that's going on. And so I'm kind of glad that we're, we're dealing with that. It's difficult stuff to it, talk it, about. It is difficult stuff. And, and it's easy to like scapegoat and talk about how could this person this or how could that person that when the the AA way is to say, what can I do? You know, uh, maybe I should, you know, be standing at the door and greeting people as they come in. Uh, are you new here? Right. You know, like just there are things I can do to make people feel more comfortable. And then with our outreach, we don't just have to go and just start talking until the time's up. We can ask questions. You invited us here. Thank you. AA, what, what, always wants the hand of AA to be there whenever someone reaches out. So we're, we're glad to be asked. But you, you already knew about alcoholism in your community. What are you doing about alcoholism? Uh, you know, what is there that AA could do to alter or improve the way you deal with alcoholism in your community? Yeah. Um, let, let's what what's your experience with AA, right? Like you, you knew where we were in the phone book. So you called us. Uh, tell us your experience and then listen instead of going, no, 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 you misunderstand. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We shouldn't tell them what their experience of AA is. We should listen to what their experience of AA is. Before we run out of time, Joe, I was going to pick your brain on something. Um, Going kind of going back to your group when you, because you, you were one of the founders of that group. And I also am a founder of, of a group. And it was a very interesting experience because like in the beginning, um, it was just me and one other guy, and we could just plan it out and do whatever we wanted to do. But um, we also decided that we were going to have regular business meetings like every three months. And over time, what happened is the group really kind of took over. Mm-hmm. Um, it's done its own thing. And to this day now, I I don't even have to be there anymore. And it's kind of a weird feeling of 
being um, in the very beginning, have, having all total control, basically, <laughs> to now, I'm just watching this thing take off on its own. And um, having, they're starting to see some personality conflicts every once in a while, and just to have the watch the group hand, handle it out. How did you experience that? Did you have any um, difficulty witnessing that? Or um, did you notice any of the kind of... Well, I mean, my early AA, you know, the first group I ever was involved in starting was a young people's group called the Yes Group, Youth and yeah. Sobriety, it was called. Uh, in Montreal, and there was about half a dozen of us that started it, and, you know, it, it didn't all go my way, right? You right. know, uh, I brought up motions, and someone else had seconded it, but it would get defeated, and then someone else, you know, I mean, that's the great democracy of AA. They're, 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 one person is not a founder of anything in AA. Right, you're right. It's, is in a meeting until there's two That's people. right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, it's like oh, that's that's Bob's group or that's right. Larry's group or, or you know, like I I I squirm when people say oh that Joe started this group. Right. I, I did not, right? right. right. I could not. No. Yeah, I called it a group if I was the only one there, right? So, right. so uh, yeah, I mean these things do uh, take on a life of their own, and and it, it's good to wear sobriety like a loose garment, and it's good to, you know, just encourage well-informed uh, group decisions and not care about the outcome because it really doesn't matter if you read this or you don't read this or whether you meet on Tuesday no, night or it really Wednesday. doesn't it truly doesn't and I'm starting to kind of understand that I think at the beginning I was a little bit too concerned that people were going to change kind of the way I wanted it to go it mm-hmm. hasn't changed too much at all mm-hmm. but one thing it's been kind of interesting I, I used to go to every single one of our meetings, and I don't anymore because now we have um, people that will just chair the meetings. And so there's a lot of people that are coming to our group that I haven't even met yet. You know that I, that I don't really know that well, and that's kind of interesting. And and they don't even know me, and I kind of like it in a way because it's just like you know I'm just it's just a meeting I can go to or not go to whatever I want to, and um, I'm I'm not like even responsible for for it really except for as much as I want to be. So. Yeah. Uh, well, and that's a sign of a uh, of a healthy group. We talk about uh, AA is self supporting, and we we all think we know what that means. Yeah. We know how to throw a couple of bucks in the pot, and that's going to go towards some good things, right? Yep. Well, it's more than that. We share our our money, but we also share our time and our talent. So you know, for two years, I'm going to be the general service rep and and mm. do some time there, or um, I have a particular, you know, I knew how to podcast. So I started podcasting. Mm-hmm. I encouraged other people to start podcasting. And, you know, that, that was just a, a, you know, a talent that I was able to offer. You know, some people like to write. Some people mm-hmm. uh, like to do public speaking. Some people uh, like to put on dances. You know, all of those mm-hmm. things are useful things, right? You right. know, some people have mocktail parties where you know they you know sort of replicate right you know, sort of social life of drinking without alcohol so you know it's important that we do that and and it, if we want to be part of the future of recovery from alcoholism we need to also do some outreach with the rest of the uh, community talking about you know these sorts of things right i mean when i do, work in a committee I'm working with nobody else is in my home group so I'm no longer in an echo chamber listening mm. to a, a very <clears throat> tightly defined you know ethos right right uh, you know so w- we have to make decisions based on people that uh, I might not have ever go to their group but guess what every once in a while they ask me to speak at their group mm. you know I invite them to my group to participate and and you get um, you know, you, you, you grow from that. Your group grows from that, too. And when we put on meetings in treatment centers, of course, you know, sometimes uh, people will, you know, what's the name of your group? Well, here's a card, right? Here's all of the agnostic groups in Toronto. Uh, come anytime you want. Bring a friend. And they do. And two years later, they're your general service rep. You know? <laughs> And if it doesn't grow, don't be discouraged, right? You know, we're not on a membership rally, right? That's right. 
That's right. I've kind of gotten used to that too. To because um, I used to um, go to the meetings, I count the number of people in every meeting, and I'm trying not to do that anymore. Just to say, oh wow, this year, this this month we got 15. This now we got 20 or whatever. I try not to do that anymore. That's not what it's about. It's not. It's at all. Some of the best meetings are just the smaller ones anyway. And as long as our group can take care of each other and serve a purpose in our community, then I'm happy with that. And yeah, I mean, everyone wants something different. Some people like the big meetings where people dress up and there's yeah. no sex going on. And yeah. you know, you're just you're attracted to the, the buzz of it, right? right? Other people, they would rather stick needles in their eyes right. than recover from alcoholism exposed to that. And a, a group of six people around a table, you know, talking is, is perfect for them, right? Right. You know, they don't need... You know, eye candy. They don't need, uh, you know, a lot of pomp and ceremony. They they just need, you know, a, a clique of people where they're going to come back next week. Maybe there will be seven. Maybe there will be five. But the group's going to be there. They're going to be there. That's what they need, right? Yep. When I was young, I needed different things for my recovery and from the groups I chose than than what I want and need now. Yes, and I'm recognizing that too. Because sometimes I criticize what I've done in the past, but what I did in the past was actually helping me at that time and, and the person <laughs> I was at that time. So, you know. How soon we forget. Yeah, yeah. And so who am I to criticize someone who's doing what I did back then now, you know? Yeah, and, and, and things snowball. You never know what action you're going to take. Uh, I'm, um, you know, get, getting involved with AA history lovers, Right. Mm -hmm. You know, in doing my own research and 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 learning about other people who are playwrights who talk about AA history and the, the plays they put on or, uh, you know, uh, write about the history of stepping stones or mm -hmm. uh, the someone else who was doing it. Uh, I'll I'll try to get you linked up with this research that was done with s sort of Midwest the first African-American members in the Midwest and sort of oh. the chain of how that developed, South Bend, Indiana, to Chicago, right? This oh, sort I'd of love to see that. Yeah, you know, yeah. I'm going to be speaking at a group on Christmas Day. It's a, quote, black group. It's It was the very first um, black group. Um, it was the very first group. It was actually the very first inclusive group in Kansas City because at that time, black mm -hmm. people were not allowed at group number one. <laughs> So mm -hmm. they started their own group, and they called it the interracial group because mm -hmm. they wanted everyone to be welcome there, whether you're black or white. Mm -hmm. And that group still exists today. They're called the Paseo Group. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go speak there. And I've got their group history, and I'm really interested in their, their history because I think that what they did um, – I, I'm just really impressed. I'm just really impressed and moved by it because they they um, boy what they experienced was really harsh. The, the treatment they experienced was very harsh, but they didn't give back harsh treatment. Right. They, they were just very open and welcoming to everybody. Said, "Hey, you don't want us? We'll take you." Yeah. You know. And and it, it's not like they all thought or felt the same way. Right. You know, every movement needs its uh, agitators and it needs its ambassadors. Right? Yeah. You know, it's just the, the, there's got to be, you know, different every hockey team or football team or uh, bridge team needs people with different talents. Right. Yeah. To sort of, uh, you know, succeed. And uh, and a is that way, too. It's a chaotic thing. And the, the results are quite unpredictable. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, there's still a lot of history to be uncovered, isn't there? Because we haven't really even, you know, delved into a lot of that stuff. That's very interesting to look at, the, yeah. that part and, of it. And the important thing is people are looking back 50 years from now. Let's make sure we've documented what, what we did. Right. And, and uh, th that we can undo some of those uh, missed opportunities right. uh, in, the, in the past. Because, yeah, it is a shame. I mean, there was so much I would like to know about... Um, you know, the first, you know, different language groups, like I would love to get direct translations back from the first Russian big book, what artistic liberties might have been mm. taken, how it works. Interesting. You know, and, uh, and like, it might surprise a lot of people, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, because every time you sort of, uh, widen the gateway right you know you 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 change something it affects some sort of change yep. and you know in some of the more secular countries where we 
uh, have AA. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just expat Americans that are filling the meetings, right? It's right. people who grew up in a very different society. And, you know, so, you know, it, anyway, I, I would love to see in all of these communities, whether they're minorities by language or by gender or by sexual orientation, mm -hmm. you know, you know, how they, you know, personalized it, because I, I think that's every bit as fascinating as a secular view. Yeah, uh, I do too. And recovery, yeah. Very much so. Well, Joe, I just want to thank you for everything that you have done. I mean, um, uh, for participating in this podcast, but for your own podcast, for everything that you've written. We read your book at our meetings. Um, you've been an inspiration to me. And um, about when I was first starting in this journey of agnostic AA, I think I learned from you probably more than anybody of how I wanted my group to be and how I wanted to be as an AA person. So I want to thank you for that. Yeah, and I hope it inspires. I, I think we, you know, we need more uh, literature. We need more, you know, maybe we were talking about service, right? Mm -hmm. Like if we uh, maybe uh, AA Beyond Belief can put together a compendium of stories of people sharing, I went to a treatment center and I told my talk and someone came up to me and said this, right? Yep. And they thought AA wasn't for them and now they're sober. Or, you know, like it just sort of, uh, you know, outreach or service journeys. If we did a like collection of books of, of those stories, yep. it would be interesting to, you know, a small demographic, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I wrote a daily reflection book. If I was in it for the money, I would have written it for all of the rest of them, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> because they buy hundreds of thousands of those books every year, and they buy maybe 1,000 or 2,000 of mine a year. That's and, funny. And I, I didn't know I would even it would even be that in demand, right? So yeah. it covers bus fare, and it, it's, a, it's a rewarding thing to do. And then it, it leads to other things. Uh, I've worked with a, a theologian, uh, and we've done workshops together, right? Yep. A, a priest and an atheist talking about AA. Uh, I'm part of the Sedona Mago Retreat Series, right? They yep. do all these different, uh, and they're all cutting edge stuff. They talk about relationships and sobriety for husbands and wives. They, oh, they talk about meditation and Buddhism mm -hmm. in and uh, they invited me to do something in uh, like October next year of the steps and traditions cool. from uh, a secular point of view. And, and you don't have to be, you know, one of our club to find that interesting, right? I, right. Mean, I mean, any person in AA is going to work with people who are queer, any right. person in AA is going to work with people who don't believe what they believe. Right. Right. So w it's good to get together sometimes for a weekend or sometimes for an hour with people who aren't like us right. and say, tell me again why you do this and why it makes sense to you because I don't get it. Well, you do a lot of stuff. Um Thank you again very much, Joe. It's been nice talking to you. Um, this will I will be editing this today, and we're going to publish it on Wednesday. I have these. I have to do these quick turnarounds. I don't know why I do that, but yeah. <laughs> uh, we're, we're all glad you do. I mean, it's like it, it's it, it's a, a great community, right? We it need is. bloggers, more podcasters, because yeah. uh, uh, you know, th yeah, that way there there will be a future. Yeah. You know, and uh, Bill Wilson would be doing it. Yeah. He was alive today. Yeah, he would. Yeah, you've been loving it. Yeah. All right, okay. Joe. John. Have a good one. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Well, that's it for another episode of AA Beyond Belief the Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you all have a very Merry Christmas coming up in just a couple days. We'll be back again next week. Uh, if everything goes well, uh, it'll be a podcast of me speaking at the Paseo Group here in Kansas City, Missouri. So until then, you all have a very Merry Christmas.